guests in the working on for months. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, as we kick off this workshop, I wanted to title uh, Hiring, Retaining, and Diverse Workforce. Diversity is one of those buzzwords we're hearing again and again, and I just want to acknowledge that in this space today, diversity is intersectional. Uh, it is not of ethnic or of color. Uh, while today's conversation will likely slant towards speaking about racial or cultural diversity, and people of color are perhaps the most widely underrepresented community in arts leadership and non in the nonprofit workforce, arts Boston, as well as the arts, as well as the majority of the arts organizations in our sector, still have a long way to go in terms of disrupting our homogeneity. Uh, we believe firmly that arts and culture benefit from the true diversity of perspectives and experiences, and we encourage our colleagues and member organizations to expand their organizational structure to welcome people of all races, colors, creeds, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, and nations of origin. So what's holding us back? According to the Race to Lead report from the Building a Movement Project released earlier this year, people of color are as educated, as experienced, and more interested in advancing to nonprofit leadership positions than their white colleagues. However, in the last 15 years, as the population becomes more diverse, less than 20% of executive leadership at American nonprofits identify as people of color. And while no one currently collects this data for Boston's cultural organization, I think we can all agree that 20% would probably be generous. It's one of the reasons why my colleague Vicki George started the Network for Arts Administrators of Color. This problem is both local and national, and no one is exempt, and if we don't work to make the change, we are I'm going to get off my soapbox now and give a conversation to our incredible moderator, Natalie Rice Harris, who serves as the Human Resources Manager at the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston. Natalie has worked in the human resources for in working human resources for the for-profit and not-for-profit world for more than 15 years, from healthcare, from the healthcare sector to the technology sector to shipping industries to the industry. She has most recently been managing recruitment and office culture at the ICA for almost two years and speaks to HR best practices both inside and outside of Boston's arts and culture community. For these reasons, I believe she's the perfect person to bring this conversation today. Without further ado, Natalie, who will be introducing your panelists. Thank you again for being here.
Ms. Lynch McWhite has served as the chair of the Royal City Arts Commission and as the national grant reviewer for the National Endowment for the Arts and Institute of Museums and Library Services. Welcome, Ms. White. And so 
when we're looking to work with someone, um, I mean, I'll be very honest, the finance office looks at one thing, right? <laughs> uh, but in terms of the cultural fit that we look for, uh, the organization that I work with, Arts Consulting Group, does help organizations with uh, executive search and leadership transition. But we're management consultants more broadly. And what we're looking for is not just the intent, right, but we're actually looking for that plan, right? And it doesn't have to fully be in place, but we want to see the metrics that mean that if we bring diverse candidates to you, or we talk about those issues around diversity, that those conversations are heard. We may not necessarily be able to move the needle fully in the search process, but what we're looking for, hopefully, is that is that attention to that whole thing. Uh, we would, would not be comfortable working with a, with a client that said to us, oh, we just don't really care about diversity. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll be fair. Some people lie to us and say, oh, we really are looking for diverse candidates. But in the back of their head, they're like, no, not really. <laughs> and, and that's difficult, right, because you can't necessarily change that right away. What we certainly try to do is through the process, we bring up issues about being inclusive, casting a wide net, bias, and those sorts of things, hoping that in the process we're also moving change agents, right? So those are some of the things that, that are really important. And I gotta be honest, it's not always easy to just, you can't say no, right? All of us have a product we're delivering to the world to certain people, and so you have to kind of work with them where they are. And that's just one of the realities that we can talk about as we go through the, through the dialogue. Thank you. Sure. Evelyn, how has making a diversity a priority as a theater of change your own Yeah. <clears throat> so, one thing, can I just reflect back on readiness? Okay, for just a second. That um, uh, I think the start of this panel is a good reflection. If you can't say in your organization the words white supremacy, and you work in the arts, you work in nonprofit, you work in systems of white supremacy, then you're not ready. You, you need to be able to talk openly about how these systems have been put in place and how Western culture and Western art rules our field. So I don't want to say that one. <laughs> um, so uh, going back to the question that you asked Natalie, um, so um, how do you make diversity a priority at the theater principle? So we're an LGBTQ uh, specific organization. We're more by and about LGBTQ folks. For uh, many years, the organization has battled LGBTQ is code for white. And so um, understanding that uh, funders think that LGBTQ people are only white people because how uh, folks show up in media, how they show up in um, print, um, even how the press here in Boston has covered our work, um, that it, a majority of white folks are interviewed or spoken to about LGBTQ issues. And so I'd say that's a battle we have in our own community, uh, the LGBTQ community specifically. Um, and for us, I think it was important for the organization itself to reflect the community that we were serving. And uh, that has gotten better. Uh, we still do not have a, female, a lot of female-bodied people in the head leadership of the organization. We do not have a lot of trans representation in our organization either. And so we are trying to resolve that. Um, we do have a majority of people of color on our staff. Um, but still there's a homogeny of uh, even the people of color on our staff. So really trying to figure out how do we have true diversity is a constant struggle and a constant battle that we're waging because the LGBTQ community is so diverse and the stories that can be told through art are so diverse. And so that's something that we're constantly working on and it's um, truly important for our community and for the growth and development of our organization. Hi. Hi. What's it like to lead an organization that is truly representative of the community that it serves? And follow up question, has it always been the case in your career? In my, so I'll, I like two things about organizational readiness and then go to the question um, as well. <laughs> this is what happened when we get the road here. <laughs> now follow the road. Um, but I think in terms of organizational readiness, you know, as Evelyn has said, if you're not ready, 
ready, you're not ready, and admit that you're not ready. Um, we'll talk hopefully a little bit about trauma. Um, and so again, you know, you take on this idea that you want to do as less harm as possible. So when you audit your organization, and there's two wonderful tools um, at the door, maybe you got them, the White Supremacist Culture article, and then the continuum of being an anti-racist, multicultural organizations that are just, you know, conversation starters that you can read and say, you know, uh, and tell the truth about your organization, even if you're doing it at your own desk about where you are and assess where you are. Um, and then you can also communicate those truths to, you know, key stakeholders. And guess what? You know, even funders, because white people get funded to become ready um, in ways that people of color cannot get funded just to be, right? So again, if you're honest about where you are, um, I'm sure there are some dollars that will, like, follow it, and then you can hire some of these specialized people who work in equity, diversity, and inclusion to help you give ready. But really, it starts from an honest place. Um, some questions are, you know, what's the end game for us? So when you look at the continuum, where do we want to be in the next year, next three years um, as an organization? And then how do we have a, a plan to kind of get there? Um, because, you know, being honest with you, if you can't be honest with yourself and your organization, and, and part of the work, um, when I do EDI training, I've been trained to say, you know, you do this work and I believe it with no guilt, no shame, no blame, or no BS. But you have to approach it from a real honest place in an art in a city like Boston or in a uh, you know you, you do as much work um, attracting and sustaining a white workplace um, as you can do as a diverse workplace. So you're thinking you're not doing anything, but it's just like to maintain the whiteness of your organization will buy us some labor in a city as diverse as Boston. <laughs> so <laughs> to the question. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they're like, what was the question? So what is it like to, to lead an organization that is truly, and I would say Kobe, an organization that's truly representative of the community it serves and has always been the case for me, I largely identify as a cultural organizer. Um, and so that means I use art and culture like to build community and address oppressive um, policies and, and practices um, so that's, you know, when I, I look for where I want to work and how I want to work, it's through the lens of a social organizer, not necessarily a arts administrator, but that's the way in which I can do, like, community building work. Um, so it's been a large part of my life, even coming from um, Dallas and working at the South Dallas Cultural Center, it was based in a historically black community, and it really was, you know, the community that said, you know, we know that um, as a community value, we need a place to engage with um, our culture. So you're just a part of the community as much as the community church or the grocery store. So we were doing our part to kind of build a thriving community. Um, so it is extremely gratifying um, because you can, you know, I was there for, I'm a child of the community, but working for almost 10 years, you can really gauge the impact um, of your work or feel like you're contributing to something larger than yourself. You may not be able to shift and move all communities, but for me, um, the deep community work, um, I've been able to say, oh, this is what it's like um, to really invest in why I show up every day, especially when working with youth and children and families. Um, so it has been that way for a long time um, and probably will be that way, you know, for a while. You're currently in half of a white organization. Historic. What challenges do you does that present for you? Right, so before I answer that, I'd like to go back to my job. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to make some clarify the question. Um, it, and about the organization itself. Um, the reason I think it can be referred to as historically white organizations is because the leadership has been predominantly uh, white. The board, the uh, staff, the, um, you know, the faculty, uh, if, from what I understand that's been historically uh, the case, even though it's an organization that has been serving community children, students, and young people of color throughout its history, throughout the years. Um, and so it was an outlier for the community in which it was in, because it was in the South End 100 years ago before it was the South End, we all know today. Uh, so I just want to I want to clarify that, and I would say that um, further clarification. If I went to a church and was eighty percent black, I call it a black church, right? Um, and that's just that's just the truth. Um, and so, I'm, depending on what the music is. <laughs> I would, I 
would say that you know historically that has uh, that has been the been the case uh, at the music center. Um, and actually, one of the one of the challenges I think in the very beginning was creating an environment, a culture in which just as much as we talked about programmatic design and accountability, and we talked about our finances, and we talked about uh, organizational efficiency, we also talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and it was equitably discussed which to some inside the organization, it was more than it had ever been discussed before, so it was like it was a bit much. Uh, and then there was, I was fortunate also, I think in the organization that uh, I had a board, uh, that I had the wind at my back with my board, a predominantly white board, they were also, they were they were down, because they, when they selected me, they had another option. Um, and uh, I said in my interview that you don't feel like you've done anything, even if you hire a black ED, you've done nothing. Uh, the work begins after I get here, and how much support you provide for me after I get here. That's the work. That's right. um, and so um, I, I was really fortunate that the board, they chose me anyway, right? <laughs> 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 because I was real black in my interview. Because, and that was the reason I was that way. And the reason, I was, the reason I wanted to be my authentic self because I wanted them to hire me. I didn't want them to hire my representatives or some, you know, um, some whitewashed version of me. They were going to hire me. Um, and, and again, when I, found, I found out when I got to the music center that there were already staff on, on board who had been working, you know, really, you know, behind the scenes getting some things going. So when I walked in the door, there was a racial equity assessment that was done right when I walked in the door. And the interesting thing about that was, it's really weird walking in as a new black ED, given a racial equity assessment. Um, there were, and that's something that, you know, Marie, who's here, our COO, she was a person in Marie Ty, raise your hands so everybody can see. And she, had to <laughs> uh, she was one of the people who were really, I think, you know, really got that got that going. That was something that was deep inside her thinking. Um, but it was interesting that I, I ended up as the black ED, owning a lot of the backlash from it. Um, even though I came in at the end, everyone's like, "Wow, he got started early." That was an actual a direct quote. And I was like, "I'm like, black all year." <laughs> At birth, yeah, I started early. Um, so there are there are some challenges in there. I think that you have to have people in positions of authority. You have to have people who it's their job and their responsibility to um, to fight the status quo. Uh, you have to have if you do have white leadership, you have to have white leadership that says I support everything that this person is saying. Not that you are assimilating or taking on um, or colonizing others' ideas, but you're saying no. I actually am supporting and lifting up the people of color inside my organization. Uh, when they're in these conversations uh, and getting over some of the fragility of it is very important. Everyone is familiar, many of you are familiar with the term white fragility. And again, you do have to deal with this space of whiteness in order to be able to have these conversations in a genuine way. Um, you cannot, because I think as a person of color, there are things that we say when we're not around y'all, mm -hmm. it's a predominantly white room, so I'll say it that way. <coughs> um, you know, what do you think we say when we're not around y'all, we don't say when we're with y'all. Um, but if we can create spaces in which those truths can come out, well then we can start to address some of the, you know, the inequities that exist and, and the power structure that is clearly oppressive, right? You know, we can start to deal with those things because if our conversation oftentimes in, in spaces in which there is not this uh, white supremacist space and culture, they are very robust. And when we go into those spaces, it's actually, it's, it's interesting how elementary some of the conversation is. And it's because we're trying to protect the white supremacy in the space. And so we don't, so the truth is not spoken there. But I feel fortunate because I'm the executive director. So my, my organization, I mean, I call it out. Um, and I call it out daily. And even my board uh, is supportive of me um, calling it out. Um, we stumble, but the, the, the support that comes from the leadership is very important because the truth is, I'm fighting everybody. Uh, I'm fighting everybody a big chunk of the time uh, when ways people don't see organization. Um, because again, I'm in conversations sometimes like this one, not really here, but nationally as well, and you get the blank stares from people where they're like, I don't know exactly what it is he means, um, but I'm gonna take three nuggets back to my organization and implement them potentially poorly because I didn't give enough of the work in as a leader to know the real truth and to find it out in a way it was implemented. So we'll move into climate. What advice would you give to predominantly white institutions who are struggling to hire a parent of color. Just hire the color. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they hired ACG to hire me, so. I have been taking credit for this all over time. Which is so not true. Um, so a couple things before I launch into 
what I would tell predominantly white organizations. I want to be really clear. We all have a bias as it relates to this kind of thing around hiring. And that means I have it too, and all of you in the room too, right? So um, I have a certain bias. If you haven't taken that great bias test, um, it's just black and white bias, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't have um, other layers to it. But, you know, uh, much to no one's surprise, I was slightly biased towards African Americans. Go for it here. Um, but it would have been nicely neutral. I would, have been, I would have been so proud of myself. But it just, it is what it is. We all have bias. And I just wanted to introduce that because we're talking about predominantly white organizations, but a lot of our wonderful up and coming starting organizations culturally are started by culturally diverse people that then themselves can't figure out how to diversify their own organization, right? And so um, I want to just be really clear on that. We all have kind of our little circle as organizations in our culture, and, and we have trouble understanding how others can fit into it. So one of the things that people do, I think, that are kind of mistakes when they say we really want to make sure we find diverse candidates and potentially hire a diverse person. Um, the first one that's always there is they set unrealistic barriers around educational or other requirements. And I've written about this in the museum field. I'm still not sure why the person in the gift shop who pays you know, minimum wage, right, needs a bachelor's degree. I'm just not sure I get that. So there's often unreasonable expectations around degree requirements or years of time in the field. The arts and culture sector broadly, right, is more diverse than it was 20 years ago, right? But it still has a long way to go. So if I tell you that you have to have 10 years of management experience, right, by, just by putting that out there as a number, I'm not going to get as broad of a net if I'm more realistic. And to be fair, the studies show that that also creates gender um, inequity because men will apply for a job if they have six out of 10 qualifications and a woman will feel like she needs all 10 or maybe nine, but she would never think of applying if she had six. That's just a general survey that's been done. So those barriers, I mean, some people read the things and they go, no. There's also a tool that they talk about in terms of the language and job postings being kind of skewed masculine or feminine, which is an interesting thing to think about. But so one of the barriers is right away, the qualifications. Setting the bar all incorrect. And then also not using a process that tries to remove some of those issues of bias. And certainly one of the reasons I was drawn to work for ACG is we have a process that at our best treats everyone uniformly and fairly and removes some of the bias from the process. It's similar to the performing arts model of the blind um, audition behind the screen. Um, and that is a very helpful tool. So that's important. Um, one of the other things that people do goes back to what we started out with. The mistake they make is they don't really have a discussion around what they're really ready for culturally. And then they try to disqualify people and say things like, you know, I just don't think they fit. I don't think they really fit in here. What the heck is that? And so often, it's really just that they haven't thought about the age, so sometimes they think young, bright folks, they're just not old enough, right? The staff, upon meeting these folks, go, oh, I couldn't work for someone that young, right? That's, that's sometimes true, regardless of gender. Um, there's lots of things. And so what we try to do is, is, as much as we can going into this, let's just talk about those stumbling blocks along the way and how do we remove them, right? Because if we want to cast the widest net, that's important. The other thing is how people go about Casting the net. If you use a search firm, we have tools that we use that we think get a pretty good pool in. But on your own as organizations, we often rely on our networks, right? And most of us have networks that look a lot like us, right? And so <laughs> that's not necessarily helpful if your organization culturally is not very diverse and you're looking to bring in more diversity in any sort of fashion. I think a good example outside of racial diversity, if I may, is so today I was thinking about this as I came here. I took the commuter rail in, so I walked up the stairs, I looked around myself, walked down the stairs, <laughs> and the elevator was at the top. You know, I never think about what this would be like if I was disabled. I mean, I am disabled without coffee, but I mean, if I was really disabled, <laughs> I, I don't think about that. And so too do we not think about those other differences as it relates to diversity more broadly. So if I was trying to cast a wide net, and I wanted to have someone help me think about this role who perhaps had physical challenges, I have to struggle. I don't necessarily have as many folks in my network, right, that can inform me. And the same is true in just about any other area. So that's why most people make the mistakes. Those are the key blocks that I've seen. I have a little bit. Um, so what you're saying might made me think a lot about um, when we talk about professional lives in the field um, and some of the things, you know, I don't have a college degree and I've been able to navigate um, 
a journey for myself that's ended up um, pretty well. I won't say that it has been easy. Um, but there's a certain value of another kind of trajectory that I have now. Um, and even now, being in a position of like HR, looking um, to continue to diversify, sustain diversity within our organization, um, there's a framework um, from a management assistant group, or, or MAG, that they call this five signs of a thriving justice um, ecosystem. And it's interesting in the EDI work um, that I do with some organizations, they talk about, well, we don't want to be a social justice organization as if that's like the worst thing in the world <laughs> to be. Um, but justice has to be a part of some of the conversation and framework. Like everyone should strive towards a more um, just ecology. But in the MAC framework, they value multiple ways of knowing. Um, and when I think about my own journey, it's like what qualified me to be able to do this work. There's multiple, thank you, Evelyn, ways of knowing. <laughs> um, and they break it out in a couple of ways. They talk about um, foundational knowledge or foundational knowing, which is experimental, indigenous, ancestral, um, or spiritual or natural way of knowing. Um, they talk about practical knowledge, meaning from previous experience that you then brought, uh, turn into some type of actions. There's artistic knowing, which again, if you're raised in a black household, <laughs> maybe before you even know your name, um, there's some artistic and cultural ways of knowing and being that come into play, especially uh, if you're a part of a black church or any of those kind of institutes. And then generalized knowing, which is one that we kind of know more as you know professionalizing um, whether that be a college education or someone who's been able to engage with a lot of logic models or data and theory, um, which is one way of knowing. And for me, it's like, wouldn't it be beautiful to have a candidate that embodies you know, a lot of those different ways of knowing to be able to contribute um, to a, our organization? Um, and like Wyoming said, um, men are hired on potential. You know? So again, I'll add myself there and say, you know, I throw my name in the hat for jobs that I know I don't quote unquote qualify for based on what they're looking for, you know, just to kind of see it's also a part of my DNA to say, you know, you are a transgressive, right? So, you know, you are magic. So, you know, just go out there and just see. You know, if you can get an interview, you can get the job. Thanks, Franny. Um, <laughs> but what does it mean? And, and I would say cisgender men, right, are hired just based off their potential. But a radical way of thinking is like if we invest in the potential of people of color, hey, because people of color have proven right time and time again, if you just give us you know, an opportunity, we can show you what we can do. But largely, an a, a organization that's not willing to take a chance on someone's potential, to me, also says that, oh, maybe you're not a learning organization. Maybe you don't invest in professional development or co-mentorship in such a way that you even believe within yourself that you can take a candidate um, and you lead them to where you know they maybe should be or give them the skills within the organization. If someone has to come to your organization knowing everything, which is like unrealistic, again, it's like, well, what is this organizational culture really around learning and creating um, a career paths? Evelyn, um, the process of hiring kind of theater principal is a long and What was, what can the cost be when you truly wait for the right person for the job? <sighs> Assuming Carol is the right person. Carol is the right person. Carol is the right person for the job. You've heard him say three things already, and I know he's blown your mind. You get that every day. Um, I have the opportunity to experience his brilliance every day, so I feel very privileged that way. Um, I just have to say one thing about credentials. Uh, so an experience I had uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference, which in and of itself has its own privilege, right, that you get to go to a conference, your organization can afford to send you to a conference. And I was in dialogue, let's say, with a woman who was working for a very well-known uh, company, uh, Children's Theater in D.C. And we were having this heated debate on credentials when you hire someone. And she insisted that her teaching artists have master's degrees. Master's degrees. And I said to her, <laughs> screaming across the circle, how much do teaching artists make in your organization? 
And she kind of, oh, you know, avoided, 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 avoided. <laughs> And finally she said, they start at $12,000 a week. <gasps> and I almost walked across the circle of black the face. I was like, how can you demand a teaching artist to have a master's degree when you're not paying them anything? And, it's, and they have hundreds of teaching artists at this organization. So, and it was just a common practice. Mommy and daddy have to be able to support you in your first few years in the job. All of us did it. We all put in our time. You've got to put in your time too, right? But how do you survive? How do you feed yourself? So just remember that you, when you're looking for the gift shop person, the experience that people bring to that, what does a welcoming environment look like? What does customer service look like? You're not thinking about what freaking degree someone has in order to use a cash register, or in order to do tickets, or in order to teach people in their own community. I almost said a bad word again. So, yes, I held it. it, 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 it. <laughs> okay, so now back to Carol. Oh, yes, you. Well, so Carol just wants to interject this, and again, largely from my field, my friends who have, you know, either undergrad degree, degrees or advanced degrees, they all say, you know, because arts organizations are not a monolithic, that like, I didn't learn what I needed to learn to work at this organization. So there's further investment that happens after you've accumulated so much debt and you've navigated so many systems to actually get the degree then on the first day of the job or the first year of the job is like what the freak you know i spent it just uh, i mean yeah. so we can be honest right yeah. so most of the arts management programs because they only value one way of knowing or trying to train you to run the kennedy center right and there's only so many jobs available at the kennedy center so many people who want to work there so it's not applicable across organizations so even when you have you know this career and you account you know it's not like arts administration degrees are cheaper than any other degrees they're not as expensive but it's not like you get a discount because you're going to make 12 dollars an hour <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's still some ongoing learning that has to happen after that um, as well yes okay so now to the hero question so if uh we uh yes it was long it was arduous and it was worth it um the thing about, if you read your white supremacy culture article, this sense of urgency, we have to get somebody in here um, immediately, that, um, that is something that we just call into question every day. Now, it's not to say that folks in our organization, particularly folks of color, in our organization, while we were looking for Harold, suffered, right? They were often the ones that were given the, the tasks that were you know, falling off of people's plates, and it was hard. It was a hard period of time for us. And then the impact on Harold when things had been put on pause, when systems had gone under during the time. So understanding the impact on Harold to kind of pick the ball up and run with it, and the burden of that um, was something that was really difficult for the organization. And we're in this moment of change in our organization that change is also difficult. So um, the backlash of having um, people of color leadership is real. Uh, Harold feels it every day. I witness it every day. And um, also the invisible labor that happens when you're waiting for the right candidate. So who are the people who are doing the invisible labor? I just want to say, Colleen, when you called out your um, coworker to just say like all the labor that they've done for you to enter into that space, that leaders don't often do that. Say there were people here before me doing this work, and I want to acknowledge that work. Um, and uh, I think Harold also does a magnificent job of that, of really acknowledging the work and the labor of folks that <laughs> uh, work hard. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Maybe I called you up. See, now I got you back. Um, so, um, well, I would say that um, the work that I was doing before I moved to Boston, I loved my work. Um, the work I was doing in Memphis before I came here, it was, I felt like it was my life's work. I was sort of looking, because I was looking to transition out of my performance career. Um, you know, I was doing that, and I was looking to transition out of academia. I was tenured when I was very young, I was very fortunate, but you know, it was kind of it was my time to move on from that too. Uh, and I was, I was kind of looking around, um, but the, you know, I had a friend who works at Opera Memphis who sent me an ad. Uh, he was like, oh, you should check this thing out. I was like, all right, you know, I'll give it a look. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's an ad. Anyway, someone sent me this thing and I looked at it and I was like, oh, that looks, um, that looks interesting. And I looked at the job description right at the top, the very first thing on it was talking about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about it from a very disruptive perspective. So it was like, uh, we want someone who is going to challenge the status quo, challenge our board to think beyond the way we've been thinking, looking to develop new programs that will make us relevant in the future, looking to create an organization in which our staff match the demographics of the students that we serve. And I was like, bruh, like, I don't want to leave, but I would leave for that place. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, if it was the intro, and I had seen other ads, and I felt like that was the point of my life, which I was becoming more marketable, but I didn't want to just go to another place just to go to another place. Uh, but there was something about the way that that job description was written, in which it was actually written for me. Uh, and when I got here, I realized, I was like, wow, it was what the job description said. Um, from a diversity statement perspective, uh, my true feeling is that those things are whack. Um, and the reason I feel that way is because they, they speak to intent. Um, and intent is irrelevant. Impact is what's relevant. And so you have this wonderful statement that says, we want to be blank and we want to be blank. And by 2050, we're going to be blank. But next year, we're going to be the same. Um, you know, and I feel like those things are, you know, that's, a, that's kind of an issue with me. And so I do have, I, I push back typically when I see a diversity statement. Uh, short story. Woman, Americans for the Arts, they were talking about their, their diversity statement. Here in Boston, actually, the conference was here a few years ago. They were talking about their diversity statement. I sat in on this session. And the statement is, it's a very nice statement, but it is, it doesn't have any teeth. Um, and there was a, um, they were saying, you know, but we needed to meet people where they were, you know, and so this is going to take us some time. And then there was a black woman who raised her hand, older black woman. Uh, she must have been in her 70s. And she said, while you're taking your time, know that there's some of us, some of us that have been waiting for a long time. Um, and so see us too when you're making your decisions. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting, and I thought that was a very powerful way to describe that, is that when you talk about that white culture and white supremacy perspective, it was like that perspective trumped this other woman's, and it was clear institutionally that it did. Their, their, their statement of diversity actually did more harm than good. Uh, and so unless you are going to absolutely hold yourself as an organization accountable and hold people's jobs accountable for the, whether or not they're moving certain metrics inside your organization, whether or not there's certain culture that's coming to your organization, if you're not doing that, the words are cute and they make you feel good about it, you can pat yourself on the back, you've actually done nothing until it has an actual impact on the organization, followed by the sector, followed by the community, followed by the city. Uh, if you're not holding yourself accountable for that, then you're, again, it's, it's feeling good for the people in the room, but it has no impact.
the right order is being in communication with community first. You know, what community are you serving? Not the funders, that's not a community. That's not who that is. The people who are participating in your work. Um, audiences that frequent your work. Um, who is the community? Um, define that. And then try to understand how your staff reflect that community, which I mentioned before. And then um, make sure that the culture of your office reflects the community that's in your staff. Um, there are ways in which I think we, we are very successful. Queer culture is alive and well in the theater. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that in other offices, we have to say to interns, like, don't do this anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> specific environment, and um, that's true, we do have to say that. We have high school interns right now, it's like, oh god, oh, take that conversation to somewhere else, y'all. Like, have that at lunch. But um, it's important for people to feel like, I belong here. There are people who are like me here. Um, and it's important for those interns to feel like they have a home, a creative home and otherwise, in our offices as well. So this question of shifting culture, I feel like it's constantly shifting. There, it should feel like sand under your feet, really. Every new staff person, every new intern brings in something and offers something to the culture. And if you don't pay attention, that'll continue to be a revolving door. Right? That, that I think nonprofits and our organizations in general are ju just accept like, oh, they, people don't stay, and that's just how, kind of how it is and don't accept, well, maybe we are paying people equitably. Maybe the culture isn't reflective of the folks that we serve in the community. Uh, and we're not willing to change it, shrug, right? And um, I think if you're paying attention to what each human life brings into the space and how there is a ripple effect, and you make that part of the culture, it can deeply impact you as a human, which I have felt quite a bit, uh, I felt plenty of discomfort, which I now love the discomfort because it means that something's possibly going right. It's going in the right direction, away from my whiteness and towards another uh, culture, another idea, another way of being. So, uh, yeah, that's me grappling with that answer alone. I know. I mean, Ellen and I, we've developed this beautifully problematic codependency. <laughs> I mean, it's got to make sure our leadership work at the theater of <laughs> So again, like we're, we're you know, one and the same. But what I'll add to that is, again, I think we have to interrogate what it means to have a, what, what does human resource mean? In a, you know, so it's like, how are we not all human resources? We've made human resources about um, legality and policies and enforcing, you know, some things most of the time. I come from the city of Dallas, but there's a large human resource department, and it's like, well, are they really resources to humans? <laughs> 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 I was like, wait a minute, the sound of the law said this is where I'm supposed to come as a human being, right? Um, but what do they come? So again, so it's the type of human resources that you need, and one of the things now when we're looking at JavaScript is a theater offensive. And largely, at our core, we are a community development organization or, or community engagement. So why is that not reflected in everybody's job, right? Uh, because they engage with people. The same thing with human resources when we're talking about creating a culture where people feel included, that their worldview is there, they feel welcome, they belong. You know, how is human resources not a part of every um, job in the organization? Um, and not just this person who can interpret, you know, who's done the good work of memorizing our policies. and. and can I just uh, to jump in on some kind of some of the things that Evelyn said? If, when you're thinking about being inclusive as a space, and, and it hurt my heart a little bit just to hear you say that there are conversations that we can have here, uh, but you can't have them in other places. Um, it could be conversations that are really inappropriate for other places, yeah. but it could be, but it could be some that are also not welcome in other places. And so I feel like um, when we, you know, one of the things I share a lot when I have these conversations, and when you talk about diversity. You have to kind of deconstruct your organization, right? If you're trying to diversify your organization, you have to deconstruct and say, why is it homogenous? 
um, one of the things that we're fighting against, if you're thinking about it from you know, an equity perspective, well, deconstruction organizations, like where are the inequities within our organization? Where are the systems that, we're that created the inequity that are within our organization? And we talk about being inclusive. What are the things deconstructed and say? Where are the areas in which we are actually exclusive? We are, you know, unintentionally or not, which again, intent is irrelevant, but the impact of our work is being exclusive. Where are those spaces? Because that's where the work is supposed to be targeted, right? What the work, it rarely isn't targeted there. It's like, okay, we don't have enough brown people. Let's see if we can't find some brown people, right? And that's it. But it's like, hey, brown people don't want to go there. Right, you can find some, they'll come in and they'll leave, and you'll say, well, we tried. Mm -hmm. But the reason they left is because you didn't fix the actual problem. Right, the problem was organization. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and then that, you know, and I, I think that, you know, again, you have to have, and this is, I'm new to Boston, so I don't know what the thing is here, uh, to be honest, but, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, almost by my board's uh, a mandate uh, to come in here and say certain things as it relates to my own organization, but I, I tell my mom's team that we're building a model for things. We're not just trying to get our work done. We're trying to build a model. And I think that if every organization were doing that, then these conversations would actually make some progress rather than us reading a Boston Globe series that says nothing has happened for years or whatever. Um, because that was egregious as a new person. Uh, that hurt uh, as a new person who moved his family here. Because um, I moved my family and my two brown sons live here in that, in that article, uh, in that series of articles. And that's what I saw. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we do have to get on the other side of some of these conversations by being what Marie would call courageous. Rather than call them difficult conversations, we should have courageous ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tony, why did someone like, tell us, tell us your organization without a specific human resource stuff, what would come Well, we do. We have Marie, she does a lot of the HR stuff. <laughs> You know, I, I would say that as a as a, you know an organizational leadership, a lot of the work starts there. And so, if you're in organizational organizational leadership, if you're in senior management, if you're in those spaces, then you are duty bound. Uh, I feel like to have a certain agency around these conversations. Now, I don't know if you've seen there are these New York Times videos um, from different races talking about race. Have you seen them? If you haven't, I recommend uh, checking them out. Uh, you can find them on uh, on the interwebs. Uh, YouTube has got them. Um, but they have natives, they have, uh, uh, I think, Asians, they have black and Latin, and then they have uh, white groups as well. And it's really interesting to hear the non-white groups talk about race, because it's very eloquent. Um, and it, when there are, on, the, on this video, again, it's a small sample size, so it's not speaking about all white people, um, but it was, there was this comfort, it's like, I don't want to say the wrong thing, um, I don't know what to do, it's very uncomfortable, I don't want to be called a racist, so I just don't say anything, I don't want to sound stupid, so I don't engage, you know, those are some of the things that happen there, and so really trying to create a culture in which that's not a thing, uh, in which it's like, it's okay for you to make a mistake, it's okay for you to say the wrong thing. And it's okay for me to be as black as I want to be all day, um, right? I'm going to bring my blackness to work every day. Uh, I'm smart as hell, but I'm bringing my blackness to work because I'm smarter when I'm black. Uh, <laughs> you know, my black version of me is much smarter. Um, and I learned that when I stopped code switching. Uh, when I stopped code switching, I was like, oh, I didn't even know I could think like that because I'm not wasting any of my energy trying to make myself acceptable to you. Uh, you know, and so, you know, but again, most cultures, their expectation is that I would make myself acceptable. So I couldn't wear my hair natural. I couldn't wear dress if I wanted to. I couldn't wear my, I refuse to code switch today because I'm just too tired t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but as a chief executive, I can. But those of you who are in leadership, you have to create a space in which that is okay. When somebody walks in with their hair natural, you tell them, your hair is looking dope today. Mm -hmm. You know, or you know, when somebody's walking in embracing their authentic self in any month besides February, right? <laughs> you tell them that you appreciate the fact that they're bringing themselves today. And I say in my, I say every staff meeting I talk about, I'm bringing my authentic self, and they've heard, everyone has heard me say. It. I was like, if I say that that was whack, and you know, and I say that that was super dope, and if I say uh, don't play yourself in the staff meeting, it's because I'm bringing my authentic self, uh, and I'm hoping everyone else will do the same. And there are several staff members have said, particularly ones of color and ones who are LGBTQ actually, they've also said that, wow, it's so great. I, can, I brought my boyfriend to work for the first time. I've never brought my boyfriend anywhere. And because of this culture here, I actually can bring him. And I feel really good about it. 
It wasn't because of a policy, it was because of the culture that was created there. And so really it's on leadership to actually own that, own the success and or failure of it. Diana, how does the hiring process work differently at organizations that have an HR staff as opposed to those that don't? What shifts have you seen in the hiring and retention practices through your career? So let me ask that by kind of digging into a little bit of what Kimberly was saying. But actually, you know, before I say this, I should say how incredibly unfair it is to invite somebody from the fine arts world to sit next to the theater people. Because <laughs> I was at TCG in St. Louis, the theater people are 10 years ahead of every other section of arts and culture in the dialogue. They will say things, they will say things that people will not say, and so, I'm channeling my inner external person. Okay, so <laughs> I'm an introvert by nature, but you guys are gonna push me here. <laughs> a couple of things. Let me dig into what some of what Colleen was saying. So I'll be the the face of those others out there that are trying to make a more diverse workforce, but have some issues. And so what does an HR department mean or not having one or some of those other things? So the unapologetically black, the unapologetically gay, the unapologetically whatever you want to be, that scares the heck out of other people, potentially, as it relates to lawsuit, right? Whether we like it or not, the number one reason businesses are sued are HR issues, okay? And whether we think about that when we're engaging in the interview and the hiring process or not, please know that there's someone around the table who's thinking that. that that's a natural fear, and you may say, oh, don't worry about it, I give you a pass. But there's sometimes, you, there's only so far you can pass, right? And I feel like that's important to mention, and I don't mention it from the perspective of someone who now helps with executive search. I also mention that's the perspective of someone who worked more than 23 years as a museum director, where I often was the only person of color on my staff. So me being the ED didn't magically dust the organization with other white people. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, and Janet knows this story, we hired a black consultant and one of my board members walked in, walked right past them and called them by my name because they just assumed black person, that's why I went, hey, why not? That was not me. Legit. Okay, so, what does an HR thing have or help you with in terms of that piece? I would just say there are some structural things around this. In our desire to embrace diversity, we will make some mistakes. You know, you can be clumsy with it but you actually can offend and you can break laws and so forth. And so there's an issue here in terms of trying to do it the right way. There are some helpful areas about having HR folks. I love HR people. They were ahead of these discussions, kudos, around diversity, <laughs> around organizational culture, right? But most of our arts and cultural organizations think it's just payroll. So we let the bookkeeper do HR because, you know, they got to end the benefits of the payroll. No, it's bigger than that. So Harold is correct, and everyone should have something to do with the resources for humans, I love that. But if you are trying to diversify your staff or change your culture or just be more broadly open to this, whoever you are, you can start kind of deputizing yourself as an HR person by doing your research and your reading, right? And you don't claim expertise that you don't have. One of the ways you can avoid offending is if you're really honest, if it's like, well, this is you know, where we are, this is what we're thinking, and you're just very honest. But we all want to be experts, right? So we decided we ought to have a diverse workforce. We want to be diversity experts right away. And it doesn't work that way. But I think when people are much more honest, right, as hiring people or people participating in the hiring process, even if you don't have the training, that's really, really helpful and important. I just feel like I have to say that. And what I hate to hear in the hiring piece, and this is my last one, is when people suggest that having a more diverse candidate pool or workforce automatically assumes that you're going to get or lose something, right? That you're going to, one way or the other, right? Um, everyone up here is infinitely qualified with or without our degrees, with or without our experience, right? But the point is we have the right skills to do the work, and that's ultimately what happens, right? Being black is, is what I am. It's not what I do, right? That's not my profession. And so part of what we're trying to also get people to understand is that removing the bias is that you're looking at people for what they can bring to the table, mm -hmm. not just what they did. Mm -hmm. And that kind of trumps, oh God, I used to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but that really will make a bigger difference in terms of getting the right group together. Um, and so HR people are really good at pushing you to think about hiring for the fit of the organization in terms of what someone could do, what they could bring to the table. So 
even if you don't have one, I bet almost everyone in this room, if you raise your hand, 80% don't have HR folks. Don't let that stop you from thinking about the good parts, because it's HR folks that got this discussion really, in my opinion, really moving forward. So we talked about the statement from um, one of the race for these conversations at the Boston Foundation. The statement being, we hire for diversity, we are board for innovation. How can historically homogeneous organizations welcome those from marginal, marginalized populations? So this is my favorite statement from that. One of my favorite statements from that conversation. Um, and again, I think when that organizational assessment again around like where we are, how we got here, and you know why we're comfortable here or not comfortable here, where we want to be, where we want to be, when we bring up the race to lead some of the findings, what they do say, if it's not about education, desire, will, passion. What is it about? And they say it's structural, like it's systematic, right? So again, an organization that is not willing to um, identify the systems of oppression that are at work within your organization and then disrupt, and then disruption is not enough, right? You know, when we talk about, this is a movement, and what encourages me, there was a gap, um, an opportunity in the field, right? So a couple of years ago, because of the nonprofit sector, the art sector would say is about 50 years, 50, you know, some odd years old. And a lot of our leaders were retiring, and especially leaders of color, some from founder led organizations, from, from other organizations, um, coupled with the fact that we were talking about pretty soon we'll be a majority minority um, country. Um, and a lot of other things created this wonderful opportunity for people like me and my generation to say, oh, now we can go to war. Right? You know, now is the time to really make some changes because as a society, we're thinking about this thing differently. And we can recognize all the work that had been done before us. I mean, I co-founded and founded a member of an organization called the Next Generation, Next Gen National Arts Network. Um, because again, if the black woman who mentored me is leaving and all of her peers are leaving the field, what does that mean about, you know, at one point it was diversity, it was multiculturalism, it was cultural equity at one point. Cultural equity was actually working, but white folks needed a new word. Um, so we got to EDI. But cultural equity, again, because it was like rooted in justice, was actually working. What does it mean for all that long history of struggle? And how do we become a part of the continuum and move it along further? So we were not being called to like just disrupt. We have been called to dismantle, right? So again, so if an organization is really looking and learning about those structures and willing to dismantle those structures, then really we'll see you know, something else um, kind of emerge. Man, you sound like Team Killmonger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Team, but uh, no one's all like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's a reference to that. Um, so, sorry about that. One of the things I think that when, you know, this whole idea of, uh, if you want me to, Okay, okay, that's fine. Jumping on somebody. Um, when the whole idea of of assimilation, I, I think that that is a very, it's a very strong thing. Um, one of the things that um, I, I I've said you know, several times is that you can either you can either seek and create change, or you can maintain the status quo, but you cannot do both simultaneously. Um, and you know, if you are seeking, there is an environment in which the status quo is, is oppressive to groups of people. You know, this whole idea even of um, the majority minority is crazy to me uh, because my experience as a black man is completely different than an Asian person. But based on the perspective of white supremacy, we all get lumped together if our experiences are similar. Uh, and they are not. Uh, my, ex my experience is I learned about the experience of natives in this country who would be in that minority group. I'm like, wow. You know, but we, again, we, we, because, of, because this whole idea of furthering white supremacy, you, like, you can further it by saying, you know, let's put them all together and then say it's a threat. <laughs> right? You know, and it's, it's, it's actually not a threat. There is no, there's no demographic that is anywhere approaching this, you know, American construct of whiteness, right? Which is what it is, because my wife is, is from Stockholm, Sweden. In Europe, she's sweet, she ain't white, right? You know, that's an Ameri that is a, that is a construct. Um, in, in Europe, she is Swedish. When she goes to Germany, she's a completely different language, a completely different culture, a completely different history, and she is not one of them, right? And they know that. Uh, but here, we kind of we do this thing where we kind of lump uh, all of this thing together and call it whiteness and then make it supreme. 
Um, and so that happens inside the organizations too, that people end up feeling like they have to assimilate into whatever the power structure is. Um, and so as the, when you're in those positions of power, which is why I think a lot about that, you know, when you talk about speaking truth to power, when you're in those positions of authority, if you are a person who has the opportunity to hire someone, you are in a position of power and authority. If each person in that position says, okay, let me deconstruct everything. Let me think about what my organization is, what it has been, what has created the entire environment that we're in right now, and what are the things that I can do to be, to fight that right now. Unless, of course, you agree that your space is super uh, diverse, which most places aren't. Um, and so I really think that you know, when we're having these conversations, I really feel like it takes, it, it, those, are, you know, those in positions of authority have to actually take that and own it. I really do feel that. Um, and not be afraid of it. So, Lana, your book feedback have you heard from candidates of yours after they've been placed at an executive role in an organization. How have they, how have places worked made, how have the places that, places that they work made you feel welcome uh, as employees and made you feel welcome so I think this one's tricky because the very nature of the process that we have means we are pretty integrated with the staff, with the candidate, and, and everything over the course of the process. And so um, I won't get into it very deeply, but what I would say is we use industrial psychology tools in our process to assess uh, the candidate and the working team. And we actually talk about the soft skills that go into the work. I and mean, we talk a lot about race and culture, but there's actual hard skills to the doing of the doing, right? That's a practical piece. And there's soft skills that speak to the culture of the organization. And so what we work to do is to help people kind of get that integrated. That's really where the onboarding thing is about, whether you have a formal process that looks at that or doesn't, but it's how your team talks to each other, how you resolve differences, how you have these conversations, that whole sort of culture. Like, I want you to care that I'm excited that Black Panther's coming out, and I'll be excited about what you like, and you know, so the short of frank, let's get that discussion going. Like that soft skill piece, right? That's really where the human resources of this whole thing comes together, right? And so the candidates that we have worked with have successfully onboarded because we do that in the beginning part of the whole search. We stay in touch throughout Ask Lacoli, and I won't stop loving as it going, as it going out there. But if you don't have the benefit of working with a search firm, right? The key to successfully onboarding someone into your organization is that communication, is that check-in is what we promised you actually happening, right? And you need to have those discussions real time. You don't wait until you have performance review and they're like, you know, it's not working for me on one side or the other, right? I sound like the mom in the room. I'm so stood down there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's important to have those conversations where you're checking in, right? And there has to be some space where people can just honestly say, you know, when you did this or said that, that wasn't okay, right? And I want to be, it'd be great if we could say that you could be authentically yourself, and it is always okay. But a part of me is a true realist, and I caution people, right? Boards are a perfect example. You don't get the board you want, you get the board you have, right? You don't? Say that's, that's, true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That was true, but, and so part of that is when you're trying to talk about change, you may have this vision for your organization, your vision for your team, where you're trying to go and you can see it clear as day, but there are steps along the way, and if you don't pay attention to the steps, you can accidentally miss a big pole and fall right in it, right? And so successful onboarding has a lot to do with thinking about some of this is a little more incremental, right? We are an organizations that are often dependent upon funders who may not be a community, but are certainly a place. Right, and you were foolish to not pay attention. And so those in leadership roles often have to, I hate to use a simile, but you need to be comfortable with these people that you're asking for the money. Oh, I guess we should start talking. Evelyn, what can white allies do um, to make employees of color feel welcome in historically and predominantly white offices? Yes. Um, so, I think one thing that white folks do is say, I have no responsibility here. People of color will bring their culture, they will inform systems, there's, there's nothing I can do. And I think that's fear of stepping in the pile of racism, right? To say, someone's gonna call me a racist, someone, and, and that just makes you wanna like, no, I, I, I can't step into that. And 
So understanding your role in this, this piece. We hire for diversity. What does someone look like? What's their background, et cetera, et cetera. But we onboard for assimilation. That's us. That's white folks that are doing that, right? That are maintaining these systems to ensure that if you don't fit, you don't stay, right? And so we have a responsibility to accept change when it comes, to accept letting go of that system for how interns are hired, for how staff are hired, for how we celebrate each other. Whatever it might be, the work in the community, that there are experts in your midst, and you have to accept the change in order to not perpetuate this assimilation. Quick and dirty because I know we're part of So at this point, we'd like to open the panel up for questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I run a small um, theater ensemble. Um, so I have two questions. One is, do you have suggestions for, like, right now we are casting an actor, and I would much rather hire a non-white actor. So question one, uh, do you have suggestions for how to reach out and get a non-white actor because all of our traditional ways of casting have not worked. And two, can you talk about potential landmines that my organization might step in, like, um, I just asked this from someone yesterday, can we say directly, seeking a non-white actor, is there a different way to say that? Can we say that at all? Yeah. What suggestions can you offer? Okay, I have some questions, follow up questions for you. First thing, yeah, keep the mic. Do you have any of your directors, any technical staff that are not white? None. That's our yeah, and we we and we are if we recognize it as a, as a problem, we're not happy about it, and we are actively trying to change that and failing miserably. Okay. Second question. Any of the other actors? No, 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 no. I'm telling you, we are white. We no, no, we are we are totally white and totally don't like it. And are you telling me? I, 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 I think that how if you just answered your question. Like that's the problem. I think if folks don't feel they have a place there, they don't see themselves in leadership and the technical staff and the other casting. I think you're not going to find that human being. And if you do, it's going to be very difficult to figure out how to help them feel included in that space. Um, here I'm going to have some other advice. Right, so I think the question is why, right? So it's like, why do you want a non-white person? Um, and how, if you've, rec you've named a couple of things you recognize within your organization, then how does casting someone, a person of color, become the solution? Um, so I don't know the piece, it could be you know, a role, it could be an original piece, I don't know. But you know, is for, for what you're seeking is casting one person of color like the immediate solution? Are there some other steps that you may want to take? Um, in terms of language, I mean, A, the people are using a lot of different language, they're getting a lot of pushback, they're getting a lot of celebration. Ultimately, it is your audition call. You can write whatever the hell you want to write, right? Um, on it um, to see who you're going to seek. I don't know the Boston landscape or maybe other people in terms of where you go to post the casting and, and things like that. But the issues, uh, the questions for me is again, is that really a solution, right? Because again, you're not, well, what I suspect is you're not casting someone to just represent someone non-white, um, but there's some assert, there are other expectations that are coming um, when you cast this role in terms of what they need to represent, what they need to, there's around education. Again, we talk about emotional labor. Is this person gonna get paid the same to be with a cast of white people, but not just interpret lines and produce, you know, um, an interpretation of the character? What is the expectations besides just, you know, fulfilling the role? Can I, can I, I want to share something that's important, it's important for Harold and it's important, you know, I think, um, you know, as a, as a business, but also in you know, working nonprofit, I think about outcomes, 
uh, what's the intended outcome, right? Because then that determines all the tactics that you use along the way to meet the outcome. And it's important to know when you're thinking about diversifying the space, any outcome that's rooted in optics will fail because the outcome is wrong. The outcome is the problem. Um, because it's not, if, if you're thinking about it, it's like, oh, I would like my organization to change a lot of things about its DNA. Um, and so when I'm bringing, I'm not bringing in a person, a non-white person, right? I'm bringing a very specific kind of person into this organization who I am then empowering to speak truth, to be truth power, whatever. But then is that you're, you're dealing with the out, an outcome that is beyond optics. Uh, this, that's one of the challenges with diversity because the, the conversation around diversity speaks to optics and does not change the conversation. And the reason you diversify, diversify a space is to change the conversation, not just to change the, the, the optics. Um, and that's why assimilation is a big problem because it only changes the optics, but it doesn't change the conversation. And so uh, it might be helpful just to kind of think through it a little bit. It's like, you know, why do I want that? And also, what environment am I bringing this person into? Because if I'm in this predominantly white space, it's got all these challenges, and then I'm bringing this person in, I'm oppressing this person, I'm making myself look better, it's actually oppressive to the person because they have to then navigate this all white space that doesn't even know how to be around people of color. And so that's just something to be, be mindful of, you know, as you were thinking about uh, the with, that piece. With all due respect, if I can just push back a little, it's, I, I'm a little, from your answer, I'm a little stuck because I'm interested in changing what I recognize as the problem, and you're telling me because that's the problem, you can't change it. So I think I'm, what we're saying, before you do a play, do a workshop, right? Have a conversation. There's a lot of things that you, I mean, there's, there are other things I'm sure that your organization does besides um, put on production. So again, what are the first, what are the, you know, what are, think back a couple of steps first before you put out a casting call. Um, would be what I would say. What can else I, can, can I just give you a practical answer? So I'm not in theater, mm -hmm. but one of the things you can do is go find other actors that meet the characteristics that you're looking for in this new thing. Go start building a network. That's part of the thing. If your circle of network includes no actors of color that you're finding, go find actors of color wherever they are, go talk to people, start building a network. You're looking for people to apply, right? That's one of the ways you actually practically do it. Go start making connections, looking to meet people who might be able to get this done. Because just throwing out the nets on enough, sometimes you gotta be a little more selective. And sometimes I'll add to that, but sometimes if you work with some of the colleges that do art or theater or you know, um, performing art, those are some of the places to start as well. Um, this, that question brought up for me a reality that I've seen throughout my career and in all the gigs that I do. I'm Ken Laurie, some of you all know me. Which is that I'm, I'm amazed by how many predominantly white people live in the city of Boston, or actually a lot of the younger white people can't afford to live in the city, who know nothing about the city. So I would say all of you, in, in whatever role you are in your organization, get to know the city that you live in. Get to know the newspapers, you just, and, and stop thinking that glancing on, the, on your um, cell phone will tell you what's going on. And there's nothing like having a physical paper, copy of paper in your hand and just glancing page by page. Up will pop information about who's been hired, where that's a person of color, this community event. If you're not reading the Bay State Banner, if you're not reading the Dorchester News, if you're not reading the Jamaica Plan Gazette, if you don't know about the word, which is an events page, just looking through all these community events and then challenge yourself to go and attend some community events or read some community newspapers, watch City Live that comes on Sunday on that. These are, very, these are things that don't require a lot of heavy lifting, but a lot of times people want to change something without ever knowing the city that they live in. Um, there are two brothers who came here from more southern environments, and you have to reach out to the new city you're in. And one of the first things I know, uh, Lakotian got in touch with me, he started introducing himself to as many people in this city as he could and just talking to them what do you know about the Community Music Center? What do you know about Boston? Or is there anything you can share? If you're already living here, if you're not doing that work, sometimes it's as simple as taking out an ad because there are a lot of hungry actors who would welcome any opportunity to act. So, but, but if you don't get the, the ad or the ask in front of black eyes or Asian eyes, then you're not going to be different. But if you're, not, if you're living in a city that you don't know, right? And then the other thing I want to say, because I don't, 
always see it coming up is a lot of small nonprofits, particularly cultural nonprofits, have gotten this anti-hiring people thing. There are too many part-time people hired with, and forget whether people have been into or not, they don't have enough hours. And and um, I was recently did a diversity training for a very small cultural organization that has a very big reputation. But they were talking about diversifying their staff. They only got three staff members. <laughs> <laughs> they actually need 10 right now for the work that they're doing. So they have a lot of people who are actually getting burnt out, doing too many roles, because when the recession hit, they had a few more people they had to pull back in. They've never expanded. And so I hear a lot of people are so proud of saving money and cutting the budget, and they don't have enough staff people to diversify anything. And so that's one of the things I would hope as a sector, like, you know, creating jobs for people is something that arts and cultural sectors ought to be proud to try to do. And it's a so Let me just say, you're so correct in that as a field, we have a problem with pay, paying enough, right? Forget pay, I mean, we can't even just get to pay enough. Yeah. And so a lot of people of color don't necessarily think of the arts as a field that they can thrive in, right? When I told my mother I was getting an MFA, she was just <laughs> Please get a business degree so that you can feed yourself and my grandchildren, right? <laughs> right? So that's an important thing. Yes. Hi, my name is Carolyn Tidwell, and by the way, I'm a candidate. <laughs> I want to transition from academia to the arts. It's been my avocation. I've been an actress, I've been a jazz singer, a big band singer. The answer to the gentleman, yes, both the colleges and universities, and you need to go to where we are. Don't expect us to come to you all the time. We're not going to know where those places are or how to find out where to look for them all the time. I'm here because my job in academia was in career services. I help students find internships, full-time jobs. I know how to network. I'm here because you are looking for a diverse workforce, and I'm a diverse person. <laughs> We're going to work in the arts. Here I am with experience in higher ed of the yin-yang, because my mom told me to get a job that I could make money with, with an elementary education degree. And I worked in career services and didn't have the credentials of masters, and I've been the director of a career service office. Some colleges say yes, some colleges welcome to me in. So what I want to say is, is that folks like myself don't necessarily know the come to places like this. They don't know how to network. They don't know that they're supposed to be here. And thank you, Harold, for telling me about the arts and industries of color. And it's my inside out, and as a globalist, I can tell that. <laughs> And I'm not shy, and I'm, if you want to know more information about me, I'm on LinkedIn, Carolyn Tidwell. <laughs> and I have a resume online, obviously, at LinkedIn, and a talent resume online. I worked at Berkeley College of Music, another place where you should be looking for an actor of color. Berkeley College of Music, um, Aubrea at Berkeley, she does community outreach, she would be able to help you because she's the lady as well as myself. But anyway, there you go. And you have to go, how often have you gone to a black production? No, rarely. There you go. And that's where you have to go where we are. You have to go to the place where you're going to find this. It may be uncomfortable. Let's talk about your likeness and being uncomfortable. You may be uncomfortable because you're the only person sitting there. But welcome to our world in Boston. By the way, I live in San Francisco Bay Area, so I know the difference. When I come from the Bay Area and come back here, it's a culture shock. I don't have a question. I want to thank you all up there. Snap my fingers. Yes. Before we, before we have something added, I just want to say, obviously, as someone who hires diverse talent people, um, who hires qualified people, I want to hear from you all that are out there that are looking. Um, but I want to be realistic in that conversation, right? I, I'm hiring for C-suite jobs, right? So if you just left school, we're going to have a great introductory discussion, but I actually want to hear from you if you're looking. And I'm not going to go to your LinkedIn page because I have the privilege in that relationship. Yes. So let's just talk about that. No, okay, you pass. Yeah. Oh, hi. So I'm, my name is Paul. I work for a theater company. I just want to say, Jason.
adjacent casting, and there are some explicit restrictions you're going to run into where union active posting specifically prohibit asking about race, race or ethnicity. I, I just got banned, not banned, but I got had to revise an audition posting. Uh, you can say whatever you want about that character, but you're forbidden from, I think it's well-intentioned, but you're forbidden from saying we're looking for African-American actors, Asian American actors. You can say we're looking for somebody to play this role, Asian American man, but you're forbidden for that. But there's ways around it in terms of the description of programming statements. I'm happy to talk to you about that. All right. And then uh, my question is just that the company I work for has a sort of a struggle on diversity initiative to try and make the people in our offices and on our stages match the census of the city of Boston where we work, uh, which we, we do some data tracking. We have a long ways to go. Uh, but that's for people that we choose. But then there's also people that choose us. And when I informally look at our our board, our donor base, and the people who come and buy the tickets and sit in the seats, it is very much not exclusively the majority white. So I feel like there's a disconnect there between what we want to do in terms of people we choose, but then there's some kind of an expectation of the people that choose us. How, how, can, we, how can we broaden our scope to, so that when people are looking to come to us as opposed to who we hire, we want to be inclusive to be everybody. Right, so um, number one, and I think it's, so, it's really important in conversations like this to note that there's no magic pill. Right. Um, the, the reason that these things don't happen is because it's difficult to do. Uh, so the idea that there's one tactic or two or ten, even tactics that one could you know employ in order to get you to a certain place, I think is um, uh, there, there's quite a bit of hubris in those tactics and the idea behind those tactics to think that. Um, but I do think it's important um, to note that if that is the truth, and we have some of the same things. I mean, I, I'm, I'm up here, but we have some of the same challenges at my own organization, so we're not, you know, uh, necessarily the model uh, as it currently stands for, for answering that, but um, I'll, I'll share an anecdote just to help make me think through it. Um, my, my, uh, my former mentor, he told the story about a focus group, and um, he said that uh, he gets this focus group, it was uh, an arts organization, they were trying to diversify, get more people of color to come in, and they didn't, you know, they didn't know why. So this was focus group people from, you know, black and brown communities, particularly as in Memphis. So that's pretty much what it would be. And um, after the focus group ended, there was a black woman who went up to uh, to my friend, and she said, you know, listen, I don't know why you're doing this. Um, and he was like, well, what's the deal? Why wouldn't you go to these places? She said, well, there's some main reasons. Number one. Um, um, I don't know what they do there, which speaks to a certain kind of relevance, right? The other thing is it's too expensive, which speaks to cost. One thing, the other one was it was too far, it speaks to access. And then her last comment was the most powerful one. She said, and they don't want me there anyway. Um, and what that spoke to was this, the, the, the legacy of segregation, right? And that's what you're combating. That's what you were having a conversation about, the legacy that no tactic in and of itself will fix. But I would say, as a person of color, um, white people say, if you want people to go to your stuff, and I think you just alluded to it, then you go to their stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? So what are the places that you feel like are, that you are those places where you want to be like, or places that, from an equity perspective, will help you balance out the whiteness of, your, of a particular space? Right? Those that go to those spaces and tell those people about your program and invite people from there. Become relevant in that space. Not just go there and look, but become relevant in the space. And then say, hey guys, I really enjoy being here. Won't you join join the board of a black led organization, right? And then say, oh, now I'm here. Hey guys, I have an event in my place. Why don't you come? I've been coming to our things for your things here for a year. I have one in my space because right because that's the that's the real work. It's hard. It's what? difficult. There's a lot of work that goes into it. So again, the yeah, there's there's no like if you have a brown person on the poster, then brown people will go. Like that's not that's not a thing. Um, I see brown people on posters all the time, and, I, and, and to be honest, when I walked into the spaces and see no brown people in the space, I now distrust brown posters. <laughs> Let me just recommend the Wallace Foundation report. If you're looking to diversify your audience, learn from the work of others. Wallace invested years of research 
And it's a really wonderful thing about just broadly diversifying your audience. I cannot think of the name of the, I was gonna say the road to results, but that might be the other. The point is this is a free publication. You can download it from the Wallace's Foundation's website. And it talks about strategies that your organization can look at to try to address your audience diversity issue, some actual practical tactics, and there's case studies of other organizations, okay? So there are others trying to solve these problems, and so I just wanna throw back a solution, because you were really good at challenges. Give me an answer. There's an answer. Do some of this stuff, but also read that report. It will give you tactical things to look at to start to change the deal. I would also add um, strategic partnerships and equitable partnerships, because again, there are organizations who've been able to achieve that outcome in a variety of different ways. So again, when you sit with them and talk about what's an equitable partnership, is it cross-promotion and things like that? I want to invoke in the space the Front Porch Collective. Um, <laughs> there's representatives um, here from the Front Porch Collective um, who I would imagine would love to just have a conversation um, because it's an under so for many people it's an under-resourced field. Um, so how we can begin to share resources because if we all recognize that art is a public good, and if it's you know a public good, how do we engage the public in it? So maybe the goal can be the same, but you don't have to do it alone. Um, and you have, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about the network, um, where you just go see people and you begin to strategize again how to impact the, the community, uh, the local community. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Janet Bailey. Um, we get a reputation here in Boston of being a very racist city. Some would say the most racist city. Um, I noticed that most, I'm not sure about you, Evelyn, but most of you are from somewhere else and you've had experience in other parts of the country. Do you, A, do you think that our reputation is deserved? Uh, and if so, what are other cities doing that we should learn from here in order to do better? Okay. Oh, I'm not from Boston. I, I grew up in Here is in the deep south. 
It's absolutely no different. There is the sense that this is some kind of bastion of liberalism and inclusivity. Um, but the conversation, from my perspective, um, of which I only have that, from my perspective, it's exactly the same conversation that I was having in Memphis, Tennessee, which is actually a very racist city. Um, by, by the way it was designed, because it's based, the city was built on equities in the cotton industry. So the entire power structure is based well, on- all of the wealth is built on slavery. Right. right. So, you guys are right, so. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so like, you feel like, but, but so the thought, that's right. I'll find it for a second. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I would say that the conversation here is no farther along than it is in the Deep South. The problem, the challenge here, is that this is the place that thinks the conversation is going <laughs> right. yeah. And they know that they are. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the South is more liberated because they know that they're racist. Right. So, like in the South, people will tell you, you're a credit to your race. What does that mean? Yeah. But the most racist thing I've ever had said to me have been said here in New England. Mm -hmm. Where board members told me to watch my tone mm -hmm. and stay in my place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is real, and, and, and as our country becomes more and more uncivil, it gets more and more real. That's why those of you who have privilege by the nature of your position or race have to step into the void, right? When you see stuff happening and go, no, wait a minute, hold on, because that's what you can do. That maybe the person who is Experiencing that that reaction, that behavior, you can't do anything, and that's where you use your privilege to go. No, 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 hold on a second. Yeah. That's not how we work here. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like I want y'all to have that, but over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I believe in your right to have it over there. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, the whole idea of the segregation of the city is that there's like there should be, you know, and it, it is. I have to say, for me as a father, um, you know, and you know, and particularly as a father. It's been very interesting watching my sons navigate this city as well because they're biracial students and they were, you know, they're in the school system um, and they're we're, we're big public school advocates and big public school people here. And so we put our kids in public school. And uh, if you ever wondered what the inequity is in this city, you need to put your kid in public school. Oh, and, yeah. you, uh, you know, and in, and in some spaces, they acknowledge that that is a real thing. They don't just people don't just pull their kids out of the public school. And say it doesn't. It's not. It's not my problem. It's the city's problem, right? Which is kind of what I feel like is a lot of the conversation here. In some places, they're like, you know, well, we got. It's, I'm pulling my kid out, but I'm fighting it also, um, you know. Which I get that, you know, because it's hard to be an activist with your children, right? <laughs> so like, I, you know, don't get it twisted. I absolutely get that. But you should be an activist though, not for for someone else's for sure. For those kids who don't have that option. Good morning. My name is Matt, I work for Eric Sage. This is a question for Coley. See? <laughs> <laughs> this is my board right here, go ahead. <laughs> so, as you have your uh, conversations on a daily basis with the staff, and as those conversations get more progressive, what have you been to do with the board in order to make sure that, you know, like, that safety that you've got every day with the staff, you know, I'm gonna just like step out on a limb and assume that there may be some microaggressions and, and practices on board that, you know, are antiquated and that not like become aware that they're antiquated. So like, how do you how do you manage to maintain that that, that safety and progressive of progressivism with your staff when the board suddenly is you know present for the conversation? Well, um, I've been advised by my representation to plead fifth. No, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah, no, I've been advised. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I would say, um, I would say yes, there are, there are these microaggressions, there are those things that exist. Um, I think that that is a, you know, I mean, from my own space, from a self-care perspective, um, I was in classical bassoonist for 20 years. I was in classical music, in boardrooms, in, in receptions, and had all manner of microaggressions um, that happened to me in those spaces. So it's, it's something that, it's not necessarily new to me. But I would say um, this particular board um, where I feel fortunate is that when the, there are enough people on the board inside that power structure who do get it and who actually push back when people, when we have this conversation, particularly our, the board chair, uh, she was someone who when certain things would happen, she would come in and say, now wait a minute, you know, I'm not sure if that is uh, exactly what is what Macaulay is trying to say, or well, I'm not sure if that's exactly the direction that we're looking at going in. Uh, so again, I, and I said this before, I was fortunate that I had a certain power structure that was very helpful 
Um, and there were people on the board who um, were uncomfortable with those conversations. And they were like, why are you talking about this um, when we're not talking about our finances? Or when are we, because that's more important than this, um, you know, than this conversation. I told them that it's going to impact our finances if we do this thing the right way. Um, and fortunately, it worked out my first year that it sort of did. <laughs> uh, we're going into year two, and we'll see what happens. But uh, because at the end of the day, I am responsible for meeting those budget numbers in addition to managing the culture as well. Uh, and I have a board that essentially kind of given me a little bit of carte blanche and created a board level diversity equity inclusion committee that's going to become a staff one. And, and so these things are all um, is part of a long term process. But I have no illusions around the idea that it's going to happen in a year or two. Uh, it's a cultural shift. That it's a generational move. Uh, and so, you know, I imagine it's going to take a number of years. I'm trying to pace myself pretty well while also being disruptive. Every moment that I see an opportunity to be disruptive. Um, if there's an opportunity to disrupt any kind of a sense of the status quo, I take it. And I'm just really lucky that I have a board who's like, that's stunned a little bit, but I can't argue with those numbers, though. <laughs> I can't argue with the metrics that we're 80% white. Like, like, there's nothing I can do. I can say I don't like it. I can say I disagree with it. I can say that maybe our students are not that. But if you tell me faculty, staff, board are 80% or more white, and if you go by department, it's you know 75 to 80. So there's no department that is actually making that number. You know, it's like it's literally systemic. It's hard to argue with that. And so I, I of course, have to Just wanted to add a little bit about boards as we introduce um, board into the conversation. And again, this is a largely a staff conversation, but again, if your board is not diverse um, as well, then sometimes this is a mute point. Um, if you're not thinking about um, hierarchy within your organization. And for an organization like ours, what I encountered was a diverse board, a board A that was challenging like the role of a board and, and even seeking ways to eliminate like hierarchy and power, but a board that was reflective of the neighborhood we're in JP, Dorchester, Roxbury, and the South End, the colored section of the South End. Um, <laughs> And there's a lot to be celebrated at the offensive, right? But we have a conversation within ourselves that say, if we're the model, you know, we're in more trouble than we thought. Um, the field is in more trouble than we thought because we're honest with ourselves. Um, and so now when we're thinking about all the work that we've done, you know, to get where we are, how do we go deeper? You know, so again, I mentioned the management assistant group, and they have this concept of framework around deep equity. You know, so you diversified your staff. Congratulations, go deeper. Lean into the complexities now of sustainability, of board sustainability, and training, and things like that. Um, talk about it in the organization as lifelong work. Um, so again, I think as, as many of us are in the process, a board should also understand that like we will always be in this process, right? Um, so you're going to rotate in, and maybe you'll rotate out, but don't think that we'll be complete just because you know some of our numbers are looking different and other things. Now there are new opportunities to go. Hi everyone, I'm Brock, the Artistic Director of Puppet Showplace Theater. I'm one of the well-intentioned, is it off? There it goes. Thank you. I'm Rocky from Puppet Showplace Theater. I'm one of the well-intentioned white people at the hardworking staff of three that Candelaria mentioned. <laughs> Attached to it. 
and you should have a target. Um, someone mentioned that they're looking to match the demographics of Boston, um, which I think is you know a, a useful goal. Um, you know, for us, it's you know for us, it's a larger uh, perspective. We're like, okay, let's first match the demographics of Boston, and then let's match the demographics of the students that we serve. Um, so that is what well, that was in my job description. That's our since they are mandate. And so annually, by department, um, one of the things that I'm going to be putting in place is just a little bit of movement. Uh, everyone trying to move and increase the representation of, of people of color uh, inside your department. Uh, we're fortunate that we have, because we have a lot of teaching artists that are going to come and go, we have faculty that sort of come and go, that there is some room there. Um, there is there's space. And what I've told the, uh, those who do the hiring um, and out processing, I think, what I've told them is that if you are, if, you, if, you, if you've been utilizing your networks and the networks of our faculty and staff, uh, stop. Stop using that network, uh, because that network led us to where we are right now. And so if we're going to, want, if we're going to change, then we have to find a new network. Um, and so I was like, hey, if you are at a club one night and you hear an amazing trumpet player, you're like, man, that guy seems cool, take him to coffee. Um, you know, um, it, you know, if you are, you know, if you're at a space and there's one brown person in the room and it's an art space, go up and talk to them and say, hey, we hire him, right? Like, just keeping it very simple, but we, um, you're shifting and changing the lenses through which people view their surroundings, um, but with a metric attached to it. So it's not one of those things where it's like, it'd be cute and all, it's actually the number has to move and people's accountability actually speaks to that. And fortunately for me, I don't know who put that in there, but it was super dope. Uh, it's in my job description. Uh, in my job, and what I took, what I did when I rewrote people's job description was I took language directly from my job description and put it in there. Uh, and so the idea around having to ensure that the faculty and the faculty and staff match the demographics of our students, that was, if it's in my job description, it's an organizational mandate. From what I understand as executive director. So then I just say, Okay, and it's in everyone's job description, that language, which is something in the job description, something someone can be held accountable for, uh, because it's part of the accountability framework. Uh, I'm assuming it's part of mine, and it sure as hell is going to be part of the people who, who are doing the hiring and firing inside the organization. But you have to teach people to reframe it. But I do agree with the target. For us, um, again, in valuing multiple ways of knowing, I was hand trying to hand off the mic to my counterpart, because Evelyn is like the queen of data and evaluation within the organization. <laughs> that she respectfully declined. So I'll go to where, you know, and I think what works well in the organization is we believe in the quantitative just as much as we believe in the qualitative, right? So we're an organization, we value story. We value community. So for years now, we've done story circles and community speak outs. And so we have this rich qualitative data that said, you know, there are times you can gear up for the community speak out and you gotta like be aware where the exits are and how, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what's gonna happen? Um, but I think the organization feels now that we can stand you know, before community and ask critical questions about ourselves um, and, and feel proud of you know, where we come and really hold true um, the criticism that we hear. Because again, we're building into the organization a certain type of agility. Again, we're place-based. Um, largely, um, and you know, people are being displaced. So we have to be kind of flexible to the needs of the people that we um, love in in community with. So really valuing the qualitative data as well. And of course, I thrive off of it, right? As a uh, a black gay man from the south, I am kind of turned off by um, research because I feel like I've been researched like my whole life um, in terms of like public health, and I've engaged in that type of data. I was like this. Is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I didn't catch it. You know, it's just that this doesn't really reflect who I am. And all, I mean, you know, people lie, right? Um, and qualitative things want to be you know. And, you know, and, you know, the Southern, like, same sex positive sissy in me, you know, uh, invokes the spirit of God that says, who do man say that I am, right? Um, and again, that's really, really, when you've got street cred, you know, it's like, the numbers can say one thing, um, but if they're not validating the street cred, um, then the numbers, you know, may be inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So, and it's it's why I was hesitant to respond immediately, Roxy, is because I think there's a way in which uh, we rely on data when we have people around us telling us like this is the truth, this is the truth, and we sit back and say, well, I, 
the numbers don't say that, you know, right? So this idea that your staff could somehow report how they're doing, um, I think you have to find the people who are willing to, t to take the risk and say, be brave enough to say, look, here's the reality of it. Here's how you're doing. And I do think that Carol brought up, we have community speak out spaces where people can tell us how we're doing and we hear it and it's not always easy to hear. Um, but if we don't do anything with it, which a lot of us have done, right, where you hear feedback, you, you need to say, yes, we want your feedback, and then you don't do, I'll say it, shit with it, you don't do a thing with it. That's an insult, that's a waste of their time. And don't waste their time. Um, and because we have people of color on staff, they're the black caucus, right? And in the caucus, we have a black caucus and we have a white allies caucus, um, and now, Ooh, we're starting to caucus the board um, as well. Um, Javier, you're not know, board member. Let me be careful. Let's go. Caucus on the board. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that's another space where you can get honest, you know, feedback um, because there's no hierarchy there. I'm not the interim EP of Black Caucus, and many times they have said because you are executive staff, the things that we're going to talk about in Black Caucus, we don't want you there. Um, and it's kind of hurt because you know I'm like I'm real, real black. Um, you know, but it's like, if me being in that space will compromise the conversation, because they, you, we report out and we talk about it, um, then I don't need to be there because although I am black, you know, I'm also in executive leadership and sometimes people need a space and we value a space where staff can say whatever they need to say and it informs, you know, um, it gives us a true reflection of where we are, maybe it informs some decisions. But let me just jump in and say, if you're trying to get some practical pieces, I feel like I'm, you know, once again, a mom here a little bit. There are people who put in place hiring practices that they will not look at a semifinalist group that doesn't have a diverse candidate within it, right? That's just putting a stake in the ground going, you mean to tell me you couldn't find anybody? You cannot, um, people don't have to disclose their ethnicity or, or, or their sexual orientation or any of that, but you certainly can ask, right? And so there are some things you can do to tell people, I'm just not going to look at a group that you need to tell me you couldn't find anyone. And then you can ask the questions about where you advertise, which goes to the network piece. But there are some intentional data point things you can put together to try to figure out if you are looking for a position and you have 50 applicants, and from what you can tell in self-identification, you have 50 non-diverse applicants, then you're immediately going, okay, so part of the problem has to be where we're putting these announcements. Let's go there. I just want to put a little tooth to it because, right? Yeah. And, I, yeah, and, and on that, actually, we have, as we actually have that as a policy. Um, uh, and the other thing on that line is you have to, those who are bringing in the candidates, you tell them it has to be a person of color that we can hire. Uh, because what will happen is someone like, I brought in, I got somebody, and he is my cousin, yeah, that's right. My cousin's you know, cousin Boogie, you know, my cousin Boogie's cousin Boogie, right, you know? <laughs> um, and, and so that's the person, you know, that's what you're doing, it's for optics, I got one in, and so we should be straight. Um, but, it's you, but what I what I put in place was, hey, it needs to be someone that you would hire because now you put the leadership in, you know, responsible for finding someone they would hire in the role. Um, you know, so then when it comes to me, then if I'm the one who needs to make the call, then I can actually make the call. And if it doesn't come to me, I can say, why didn't you pick that other person who you could also hire in this particularly this role that's in a you know brown school? Um, why did we not hire that person? And so then someone would have to validate the credibility of the other person. So again, you're shifting the power structure, because now you've got to tell me why this person is a better candidate than this person who's actually representative of the group. I, I just want to say one quick thing about that. Years ago, I was asked uh, to make a recommendation for conference planning. And there was a woman named Barbara Eagle here who had a conference planning uh, organization. The conference was a predominantly white early childhood conference. And one of the things that I found is that if you ask somebody like me or somebody in the network for a diverse candidate, then don't go coming back and second guessing that we, we're not bringing you Cousin Ray Ray. Right. And I feel at this point in my life, mm -hmm. Candelaria Silva's recommendation ought to mean at least mm -hmm. this person gets an email or a call. Mm -hmm. They asked all around town. They ended up hiring her and she worked for them until her retirement. But what happened was that the affluent women at this, this conference could not believe that if they hadn't heard about someone, mm -hmm. they had a legitimate background. Mm -hmm. 
And that's and it took it took months of talking for them to finally admit that they had the elitism on top of their racism. Mm -hmm. And it really put a very bad taste in my mouth. But she and I laughed about it. She said, don't even worry about it. I go through this more than you would realize. Mm -hmm. And she thanked me, but they, they, it took them a lot to confront the fact that they didn't want to believe that if they hadn't heard something, that it could be legitimate. And I still see that that happens a lot more than I, I would think it is when you get questioned, you know, because you recognize somebody that somebody hasn't heard.